Welcome everyone to this fifth event in our 2021 speaker series, Taking the Digital Welfare State to Court. My name is Judith Rahofer and I am DFF's legal officer. With me are my, is my colleague Jonathan McCulley, who is DFF's legal advisor, and together we'll work behind the scenes today to ensure that this webinar goes smoothly and does not run into any technical difficulties. To give you all a bit of background to the series, over the past two years, the protection and promotion of human rights in the context of the digital welfare state has been a major focus of DFF's work. We are particularly concerned that the increased use of digital technologies and automated decision-making systems in social security and welfare contexts violates human rights and exacerbates the over-policing, penalizing, and exclusion of marginalized communities and those who are in need of vital support. As part of this series, we've already explored the impact of the ADHA biometric system on food poverty in India, um, how profiling algorithms decide what level of support unemployed people in Poland can expect from their local labor offices, how the introduction of a new AI system led to drastic cuts in the care services allocated to uh, people in Arkansas who relied on them. And most recently, how the engagement of a private payment company by the South African government affected the rights of social security uh, recipients in South Africa. Video recordings of all of these events are now available on our website. So if you've missed any of those and want to find out more, you can access them there. Um, and of course, also please feel free to share the links with anybody who you think might be interested. Before this series, we already discussed similar issues at some of our workshops, like for instance, our litigating algorithms workshop in 2019. We've also held a number of one-on-one -on -one and group consultations with a range of organizations working on the topic. And based on those consultations, produced a strategic document to inspire conversations on how strategic litigation can be used as part of a broader strategy to address harms of the digital welfare state. You can also find that document and more information about our other activities um, in the same area on our website. We continue to engage with a range of other organizations on this topic, so not just digital rights organizations, but also racial, social, and economic justice organizations as part of our ongoing Digital Rights for All project. Our objective here is to provide a space to the people most affected by harmful uses of technology, but who are often not actually the ones leading the advocacy or the policy or strategic litigation work to develop their own agenda. Uh, that is a process that our colleague Laurence Meyer, who leads on that project, has recently summarized uh, in a very important and engaging blog post as nothing about us without us. So this year's speaker series also seeks to complement all of that work by highlighting how strategic litigation can be used by and in collaboration with these communities to protect their digital and human rights. The topic of today's event is risk models dismantling data-driven fraud detection in the Netherlands, and the case relates to a quite a high-profile case uh, of related to a risk scoring model called Siri that was used by the Dutch authorities to identify those likely to commit welfare fraud. Um, the system relied on personal and sensitive data that was pulled from the databases of a number of different public bodies. And maybe to nobody's surprise, it was then very quickly criticized for being biased, discriminatory, intrusive, and inaccurate. And in 2020, a Dutch court ruled that the law that underpins the Siri uh, system actually was in violation of the right to a private life. The case was brought by a coalition of NGOs led by the Public Interest Litigation Project and the platform Beschaming Bürgerrechten, together with the Dutch Trade Union Federation and two authors. And with us tonight um, are Meryl Hendricks, who is an in-house lawyer at the Public Interest Litigation Project, and Nahed Samur, who is a researcher at the Law and Society Institute at Humboldt University in Berlin, to talk about the case. As part of her work at the, for the Public Interest Litigation Project, Meryl Hendricks identifies potential cases, investigates possible areas of strategic litigation, and creates case files. She also holds an important executive role concerning the coordination of cases and the involved parties. And in some of the uh, PILP cases, she is also the attorney at law. Meryl studied international law with a focus on human rights and international environmental law, and she has worked as an intern at Paulus Advocaten for Roger Cox, who is a lawyer at the, for the Yogenda um, climate case. 
As part of her work as a researcher, our moderator, Nahed Samur, works on risk profiling at the intersection of religion, race and gender in police, intelligence and migration law. She is also part of the Strategic Litigation Working Group at the Center for Intersectional Justice in Berlin. Nahed has studied law and Islamic studies at a number of different universities, including Bonn, Birdside Ramallah, London, Berlin, Harvard and Damascus. She was a doctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History in Frankfurt and clerked at the Court of Appeals in Berlin. She also held a postdoc position at the Eric Kastren Institute of International Law and Human Rights uh, in Helsinki University and was an early career fellow at the Lichtenberg Kolleg, uh, the Göttingen Institute for Advanced Study. She has also taught at junior faculty at Harvard Law School for Global Law and Policy. I will shortly be handing over to Nahid as the moderator for this event, and she and Meryl will then spend about 30 minutes to talk about the background of the case and the lessons we can learn from it. And while they are talking, we encourage all of our participants to use the Q&A function to ask any questions you may have about the case. The Q&A tab can be found at the bottom of the screen to the right, um, and we will have 20 minutes towards the end of the webinar to allow Meryl to answer as many of your questions as possible. I would strongly encourage you to, you know, write down that thought and that question when you have it rather than waiting until the start of the Q&A because there's nothing worse than just you know thinking about something really really interesting to ask and then having forgotten about it by the time the questions actually come around. Um, and on that note and with no further ado, um, Nahed, Meryl, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Thank you to the Digital Freedom Fund for allowing me to have this exciting conversation with Meryl Hendricks on the system risk indication. And I think what makes this case so uh, interesting and unique actually is that it's one of the, it's the first time or one of the first times at least that the use of digital technologies uh, made by welfare authorities was questioned on human rights grounds. And uh, the idea of tonight's uh, conversation is to find out in how far this could lead as a, this serves as, as a precedent um, uh, in digital welfare um, and questions um, and risk modeling and risk profiling. And I'm very excited, Meryl, to start off by you telling us exactly how the whole case came about, how did it originate, who did you need to have on board to fight all the way through to the court? Thank you, Nayat, and also thank you, Judith, for the um, introduction. Very happy to be here with the DFF event and to discuss this um, well, landmark case, you can call it, I think. Um, uh, first off, I should clarify that I was not one of the case lawyers uh, working on the Siri case, but I did coordinate a coalition uh, for the PILP. Um, and um, working at the PILP, my main focus is strategic litigation. So... Um, uh, not approaching uh, a case from a classical lawyer point of view, but more uh, thinking what what does the cause need, um, being the protection of private life, um, and and how can we achieve that? And would going to court help? And what other means uh, could we employ? Um, so uh, Judith already introduced what Siri did and was, so I will not go into that too much, but um, if there are any questions with regards to how it works, um, please uh, ask them in the Q&A. Um, most important thing is, uh, I think, to, to mention again, is that Siri uh, creates risk profiles. So uh, it's, a, it's a system designed uh, and, and actually released by the government on neighborhoods that they think are problematic um, and then the risk profiles are addresses where people live that might be a risk uh, at risk of committing uh, benefit fraud so there's no indication or any suspicion whatsoever it's just an algorithm that combines all these data um, and uh, outcome these risk profiles knowing this um, uh, back in 2014, there was hardly any uh, public debate on uh, the law that instituted Siri. Um, 
there there were a few critical voices, but um, uh, not not nearly enough uh, for such an invasive instrument. Um, and we uh, so the PILP uh, and uh, the platform Bescherming Burgerrechten uh, in English, uh, platform for the protection of civil rights, got together, and we discussed what needs to be done about Siri. And then we thought. Um, Lobbying doesn't help because the the law has already been adopted by Parliament. Uh, protesting probably isn't the best option because how can you protest such an abstract issue as as data protection? Um, and uh, then we figured that going to court would actually be a very effective means uh, to stop Siri, but also to start public debate uh, on risk profiling. Uh, innocent citizens, um, uh, because nothing was actually, it, it wasn't being discussed uh, uh, at the moment. It took us a while to start um, the litigation. We um, found two case lawyers uh, willing to work with us on the issue. Uh, we There were other privacy organizations involved. Um, and when we filed the summons and we got some media attention, we also were approached by the largest Dutch trade union, the FNV or the FNV. And um, uh, that was also, and, and sorry. So the reason we got a lot of media attention was actually because uh, we also had two famous Dutch writers uh, as co-complainants. They had both, both been very critical about Siri and the privacy invasion. Uh, and involving them in the case as complainants actually sparked uh, a lot of media attention. So one of the writers was in one of the most uh, viewed Dutch talk shows when we felt a summons. Um, and then the trade union became involved and that actually um, uh, sparked an, uh, other processes, um, which I would be also willing to discuss more. But I'm not sure if I'm going off topic too much, Nahid. Mara, this is fantastic. I mean, I'm really interested in knowing more exactly, you know, wh when the media uh, was attracted to that case. But maybe one one step before that, I'm I'm interested in knowing what exact data was collected. You were talking about a very invasive instrument here, right? A law passed allowing for like um, enabling government expansion of its power, obviously. So what exactly, what kind of data are we talking about? Who was collecting it and who had access to the data? Because I assume that to tell that story, we need to 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 tell how, as you said, you know, how invasive it was, how much it was getting into privacy. You know, obviously it was a secret collection of data, you know. Can you tell us something about, you know, the density of collecting that kind of data, which I guess you would need to tell to make that very case also then to mobilize and have more coalition partners coming together. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm not sure whether that was the most important part to find other partners uh, to, to join. It was also, for example, for the trade union. It was very important that Siri was being used only on the so-called problematic uh, neighborhoods uh, where mostly people of uh, lower socioeconomic status were living. Uh, and um, uh, what we found out uh, later on was that at least two or three of the six neighborhoods that we knew were being targeted by Siri also had a large percent uh, presentation of uh, people with a migrant background. Um, so this uh, this was an important reason for the trade union to join. The fact that these people were being targeted and not, uh, for example, rich people who could also commit fraud. Um, uh, but then to turn to your question with regards to the types of data, um, it was uh, mostly data that people already provided to the government for different purposes. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, your social uh, 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 tax administration, uh, social welfare information, um, but, but also maybe some medical data um, and info from municipalities. All these 
uh, data you provided to the government for a specific perf- purpose, for example, when applying for benefits. Um, but then to combine all these data uh, uh, for a new purpose that actually created uh, by itself a large violation of private life. And especially uh, this was re- this was enforced because, um, because of the... Um, a non-transparent nature of Siri. Okay, so that, that's interesting that, um, as you said, the, the, the non-transparent nature hitting particularly vulnerable, already marginalized, poor neighborhoods, you know, it, it's that combination of, of, of basically um, information that that shows how you know the government is not only expanding uh, um, its powers but it's also leaving particular parts of the population basically not protected you know so the question is the, the question is how did it come about that you could win such powerful collaboration partners like the trade unions I mean uh, I'm sure you were already busy putting together all the legal information how did you handle them? To really get you know all the, the the coalition partners on board and the media on board you know or did you, or is there like uh, also the question of you know when is the right timing to get all these people together basically like a big puzzle to to bring everyone uh, on board here yeah so um, we were lucky enough to have the uh, the case lawyers and also the um, the platform for the protection of civil liberties. They have um, uh, Simon Wis- Wisman working there, and he is very knowledgeable on the topic uh, um, as a professor of law. Um, so we we had a lot of in-house knowledge um, already, and then um, I was free to um, sort of more uh, manage the coalition more and. Um, but together with everyone, we we reached out to the media. I think there were a few interesting moments that sort of exponential, exponentially um, uh, enforced or, or or enlarged the media attention. So what, uh, f- at first we had the, the writer in the b- uh, biggest Dutch talk show, which... Uh, then led to the trade union joining our coalition. Because the trade union joined our coalition, we um, could make a new round of legal arguments before the court, but we also, um, through them, got access to the neighborhoods that were being targeted by Siri. So the trade union made a lot of work of, of working with the people that were being targeted. Uh, they they led, a, um, or together, they started a protest march and in the end, in the city of Rotterdam, this led to the Siri project being stopped by the mayor. Um, uh, so this was already before we won our case. So that sparked a lot of media attention. Then also um, uh, a journalist in one of the Dutch newspapers, the Volkskrant, um, found out that no case of no single case of fraud was actually detected by the system. So there was this large invasion of privacy um in uh, f- for these people but no f- it wasn't effective for what what it was designed for um and um then in i think in the autumn of 2019 we um we were already uh, in contact with the UN special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights uh we were actually linked to uh one of his employees on a DFF um event um, where we, uh, uh, my colleague discussed uh, our case and actually the special rapporteur was working on a report on digital welfare um, systems targeting the poor. Uh, And then um, they felt that it was a right uh, intervention for the special rapporteur to write an amicus brief. This is not something that um, uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, usual in the Netherlands, but uh, we could we could um, create a possibility of sending this letter to the court. So an amicus brief is a, a, it's it's a letter that you write to the court as an expert on your issue, and a special rapporteur. Um, there's this beautiful line where he says that we all run the risk of stumbling zombie-like into a digital welfare dystopia if we do not, if we do not watch out 
Um, and um, he's very critical of the uh, Siri um, uh, law, the way it works. Um, and this, the fact that the UN actually intervenes in a national procedure um, uh, also, again, sparked a lot of media attention. So what we noticed in February, uh, the 5th of February, we got the verdict by the court. But already the, the days before that in the media, um, the Siri case was was um, very topical and almost every um, article said there's no way that the court will say that Siri is not illegal, that it's not violating human rights. So we went from 2014 having no political debates aside from a few critical voices to actually having mainstream media saying, wow, this system is so bad, it's, uh, it, it cannot be upheld by court. And I think that's a very interesting uh, effect of strategic litigation. It's it's one of the goals. It's one of the reasons that we started it. Uh, and, and we also achieved it. And that's great. And um, did you, be, I mean, you mentioned the special rapporteur coming in. I mean, did was the Siri case based largely, did you win it largely based on domestic law or international law or what kind, in what kind of combination uh, did Siri violate uh, law, domestic or international law? Mostly human rights law. Uh, so uh, what was interesting is that the court, I mean, it's been a while, so I might not be completely correct, but uh, they used Article 8 of the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, and they incorporated the, the GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation of the EU, uh, uh, standards on transparency and purpose limitation, I think, and uh, data min minimalization into Article 8. So it was an interesting way to uh, approach the topic, uh, but that actually, um, so the court really judged upon human rights, and that's not a common thing that that the court um, is is willing to lean so much on human rights in such a case. So I mean, you've won the the case, and uh, uh, the I think it was the state secretary of uh, social affairs who said that they wouldn't appeal against um, the case. But you uh, remain vigilant, it seems, because uh, the, that same state secretary has announced that risk profiling will be part of social welfare uh, questions, nevertheless. So did you see any cases uh, after that? Blind mark victory. Did you still see any cases coming out of this? Nevertheless, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. Um, uh, it was a very important win, and the court really established uh, data protection. Um, uh, and the state secretary indeed announced not to appeal, so Siri was off the table. But then again, um, the Ministry of Social Affairs is working on a super Siri. Uh, I'm not, uh, my organization is at the moment not too involved in that, but our partners are, so the Dutch Trade Union and the Platform for Civil Rights. Um, uh, and they have also been uh, working um, on a, uh, against actually a municipality that was employing a Siri-like system, but only for that municipality. Uh, and they uh, were lobbying also, and I think in the end quite successfully because um, the system there was stopped. Uh, but then also really other, um, well, not really other, uh, it's also the government. Um, so the, the child care benefits scandal in the Netherlands, I'm not sure if you heard of it, Amnesty International also published a report recently that um, they concluded that there was a racial profiling happening, um, really destroying a lot of families, um, ch children being placed out of their homes because of governments working with algorithms and risk profiles. Um, there was a, a city in the Netherlands, Roermond. Uh, I think Amnesty also made a report about that uh, which was also using uh, risk profiling uh, to catch uh, um, uh, people that are pickpocketing, but it was actually only targeted at, at so-called um, the Roma people. 
Um, yeah, so there's not uh, enough work <laughs> still to be done, definitely. I'm encouraging definitely uh, all of you uh, attending to uh, pose your questions in the Q&A because I'm sure we're going to have uh, um, a kind of a fruitful discussion afterwards. But I want to question you, Meryl, on the, on, on the very topic of fraud. I mean, governments use the risk profiling largely to say, you know, it is our duty to come by at fraud, especially where public, you know, tax money, uh, taxpayers' money is involved, you know. So the fraud argument keeps on coming over and over again in many of the also the kind of cases you've just mentioned now, you know. So could you say something about how, you know, the risk profiling, um, the, the violations of privacy and law and the fraud argument, you know, how is that is that a new pattern of argument we're seeing here? Um, that's being used and how, what would be a best uh, aligned to, to to say that risk profiling uh, might or might not be the, the best answer against fraud and and related to that did any fraud case did Siri uh, or super Siri maybe you know did Siri um, uh, help detect any fraud in the first place so no not a single case of fraud was detected by Siri uh, um so that's, I think, a very important point to make um, when looking at these systems. Um, and yes, the, the argument of fraud is always used um, in, in uh, similar uh, discussions on, for example, racial profiling. The, uh, the um, argument of national security uh, is always made. Uh, I think the, the fraud argument, um, I mean, for example, for for our clients um, or, or our coalition, it was a non-argument because, yes, uh, of course, I mean, it's important to tackle uh, social uh, benefits fraud. But if you look at the complete picture of also tax fraud, there's a lot more money there, uh, probably. Um, so uh, the, the reason to target these neighborhoods where people with a low, lower social economic status live um, that's that's a tendency that you notice um, uh, throughout society actually that these people are being targeted uh, and and uh, have to deal with very difficult regulations um, it's almost impossible to fill in a form uh, uh, even if you are well educated be, be, there's a there's a lot of um, uh, room for for mistakes actually and uh, so uh, we say that most people uh, do not intend to commit fraud uh, on social benefits uh, it's more likely that they make mistakes um, but also uh, I don't think it's uh, you if you look at article 8 and the ECHR and and the way I mean you need a legitimate aim and by itself uh, uh, fighting fraud can be a legitimate aim. But then if you look at the uh, enormous invasion of privacy uh, of these, pe these people in these neighborhoods and the fact that they have no real option to defend themselves and the fact that they do not know what data is being processed, uh, all this taken together um, does not make um, the fight against fraud, I think, a legitimate aim that can uh, justify the use of Siri. And so looking back, uh, what did the litigation achieve in terms of strategic litigation? Why did you think strategic litigation was exactly the right means to set that precedent against risk profiling? What is it that you think we can take from there for other strategic litigation cases coming up? So um, the, the way we approach this strategic litigation, I already mentioned that it was important um, I mean, going to court and, and having a judge say something about government policy is interesting to the media. So that's that's um, it's more interesting usually than a report. Uh, so that's something to take into account when thinking about strategic litigation. And I think the Siri case showed that it was really effective. Um, I mean, it's always difficult. I think we were very lucky to have the UN involved, but if there, uh, if you could think of having uh, an an international institution or, or some someone very knowledgeable write an amicus brief, that's all, always um, interesting. Um, 
And the reason that we went to court with a coalition of civil society organizations is that uh, because Siri was so non-transparent, it was really difficult to find victims of Siri. So um, if you know that you are being targeted and investigated, uh, you can do something about it. But if you don't really know, um, then there's nothing that can be done. So um, uh, th this is why we um, designed the, the proceedings as such and, and had these clients. Okay, thank you for mentioning that one more time, because obviously, uh, in, in, in many strategic litigation cases, the difficulty is in, is in finding individuals willing to be part of this collective action. And those individuals tend to be amongst the most vulnerable, obviously, especially when um, when the opponent here is the state in, in, and especially in kind of digital welfare questions. So did you, um, what is it that you remain very vigilant about? What is it that you think, um, I mean, it seems that uh, in the uh, Siri case that the parliament was not your best friend since the parliament has voted the law without any objection. So, and that's why you had to go to court um, in the first place. And that you mentioned, obviously, that there was media partnerships that you could arrange for. But when it comes to now um, upcoming legislation, what do you think you would need to do now prior to having go through the efforts of going to court one more time? Is there something that lawyers can do before they go to court? So, I mean, for, for I think uh, now it's time for other means of change. So, um, uh, using the Siri case uh, and this verdict of the courts to lobby, um, to campaign, to maybe protest, um, that I think that would be more effective now uh, than going to court. Uh, however, if if a Siri 2 or this super Siri is adopted by Parliament, then um, yeah, this could mean that going to court is again the most effective way um, to stop it. Okay, thank you. So I think I'd love to open up uh, for the Q and A and see what the experiences, and comments, and questions of other participants are of the attendees. So please. Um, Use the, the slot, the Q&A also to ask your questions and share your knowledge and experience with us. We have one question from Noor who wants to know again in which way the data was used. Um, so were you able, for instance, to find out about the information sharing between different government agencies and, and how it was authorized? Um, and because, of course, obviously there are many government authorities here feeding in the data. So the question is, how did the information sharing, you know, what was, what did the, what did the law allow? Um, how did the information sharing actually take place? Is there something more you can tell us about that? Because information sharing seems to be a crucial um, part of much of risk profiling. Yes. So um, it was a bit, uh, um, let me think about this. I think it would be best actually to maybe um, check on our website um, and and um, also check the judgment because the court also goes into it. But to um, there was this uh, so the Siri the SUI Act actually created the the possibility of Siri and then um, there was uh, the uh, there were part there were government. Um, uh, institutions identified that could start a cooperation and that would be then a Siri pro project and then once they started they all had to share information it's a bit weird how it was organized um, and there were not many uh, um, guarantees actually for, for the data protection I'm sorry if I'm a bit fake because it has been a while since I uh, uh, dealt with the case uh, and I was more working more on the strategic litigation aspects. Um, so if you really want more information on how the information was shared between the government institutions, then I recommend um, checking our website uh, and the verdict. I mean, I understand that, you know, the entire digital sphere remains kind of a very challenging and complicated system. And the strategic litigation then has to make 
you know, crucial kind of decisions how to tackle this. But maybe one, then maybe one, we can take a question then also from Gabriel, who's asked, you know, who's asking on the impact of judgment in the Netherlands. And uh, we know you've addressed some parts of it, but um, because it was, because Syria was declared to be in violation of human rights, a number of institutions in the Le Netherlands uh, nevertheless continue to use predictive welfare fraud algorithms. And here Gabriel's thinking of Gemente Nisabad, Rotterdam, but also the W, the UWV uh, uh, and possible other um, examples. So does Siri ruling leave any room to challenge other similar algorithms? Um, is that something we can use to kind of unpack legally the algorithms that are still in place despite the precedent set by Siri? Yes, I definitely think so. Yeah. So um, uh, the Siri judgment was not was a more than the algorithm itself, but the algorithm was definitely also part of the judgment. Um, so yes, uh, um, I, I mean, I think it's a necessary step actually after this, after litigating Siri, to look at other um, government institutions, also profiling people in a in a um, likewise manner. Okay. Um, and yeah, and I, I, I would encourage Gabriel, um, uh, if you can read Dutch, to go to the uh, website of uh, Platform Bescherming Burgerrechten, um, because I think it was the Gemeente Nissewaard actually where they were working on the um, uh, to to give um, effect to the Siri case by telling the Gemeente Nissewaard, hey, look at the Siri verdict. What you are doing uh, is wrong. And through lobbying, they actually achieved that the uh, gemeente would stop uh, doing what, uh, using this, their, their uh, own project, which was very similar to Siri. Thank you. And so would you think that, um, uh, and this is a question from Joseph, I mean, how does then, you spoke about strategic litigation as one way, going to court as one way to, you know, uh, inform the public basically about what's going on and the effects of, of laws like this. Uh, would it be right that for strategic litigation, we would have to think of a kind of uh, a combination of forces between a media buzz, you know, that basically has to be escalated in a way, and and this and the, the the legal proceedings like coming together as the lethal tool, as Joseph said it, of ta for tackling this issue. So really, the question, is, as the way I understand it, is it how would basically the law and the media how how you know how do you make sure that they two are in tune? Because obviously, as lawyers, we have no guarantee what the media is going to be reporting, right? And obviously, when it, it when it affects the most marginalized and the most vulnerable, the poor. Um, migrants, there's, there isn't a guarantee that the media would be reporting on cases like this uh, the way that would be beneficial for the court. So how do you, how do you, you know, what kind of information is necessary um, to be provided to the media to help us shape that, that these kind of cases? So what, what information to provide to the media is, of course, very case specific. Um, but to go a step back, I think it is important to mention that going to court is not a solution in itself. It's it's a means to contrib contribute to a, a, a better world, <laughs> uh, to a solution, uh, hopefully. Um, and, and in my opinion, and that's the way we work at the PILP, um, uh, going to court by itself doesn't do the job. So you need to have... Uh, coalitions with civil society organizations that all have different tools of change in their toolbox. So um, campaigning is really important. So in the Siri case, uh, the Platform for Civil Rights uh, started a, a campaign um, and they, they really were uh, uh, very good at explaining the difficult uh, abstract uh, idea of, of data protection and the way in, if, uh, in which Siri was violating it uh, in, a, in a really um, yeah, accessible manner. And I think that helped a lot. Uh, and, and they were working many hours also talking to journalists. And um, the Dutch trade union obviously also has 
a lot of uh, partners and they were uh, uh, in contact with journalists and they were also really able to to use this tool of protesting together with the neighborhoods uh, to put the issue on the on, um, in everyone's mind again um, and we we yeah we just maybe maybe going to court is like 50 percent of the work and the other 50 percent is is all the other stuff uh which is equally important thank you i want to address one more question um that makes the risk profiling cases so difficult which is the entire field of transparency right so um, obviously the question is, you know, uh, where individu individuals who had risk profiles generated about them, were they notified about the existence of the very program used uh, to collect their specific data? I'm, I'm sure, you know, there was a bit of maybe some reporting on the law, but did the individuals at risk, how did they find out that there are, that, that is their very kind of individual fundamental rights being, being uh, uh, um, uh, targeted here. And the question is that usually, uh, so it's the, the, the transparency question is one regarding the, the individual plaintiff who you uh, need for court, because obviously the two famous Dutch writers were dismissed from that court case, right? Because they were not individually targeted. But the, the, the transparency question becomes also one of the big stumbling blocks in dealing with government, because government is never interested in revealing uh, um, that transparency, right? Because they would say then it runs counter to the very government policy we, we want to have in place here, you know? So what did the court say? Did the court help us for future cases about what kind of transparency criteria are definitely needed to have a rule of law um, system in place? Yes. Yeah, so... The state indeed did not want to um, say anything about the algorithm because then people could adjust their behavior um, and then the um, algorithm and risk profiles wouldn't work anymore. Um, people didn't really know that they were being targeted. It was announced um, in maybe a neighborhood paper or an official state's paper, but um, nothing you would really read. So you wouldn't really know that you were being uh, uh, that Siri was used in your neighborhood, and then the people that were not um, a risk report be because not ev not everyone was um, fitted the risk profiles, obviously. Uh, so these people weren't even notified, and their information was deleted after a certain amount of time. Uh, and I think that the people that were risk reports and then were being it could be investigated. There, in, the, the risk report would um, exist for like two years, uh, and action could follow. And in those two years, they would not know uh, there was a risk report. And then maybe, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I remember it correctly. Afterwards, they would be notified that they had been a risk report. But all this while, you don't know whether this affects, uh, I mean, your your possibility of applying for benefits or anything else. Um, so it's really harmful. And then what the court said about it, uh, um, basically because the state did not want to reveal anything, um, um, the, because the precise nature of Siri uh, was not disclosed, the, the court also could not judge how violating it actually was and how strictly the court has to had to test the violation of private life. Um, so they concluded it was uh, insufficiently transparent and insufficiently verifiable, uh, and it was. Uh, they were just not not able to assess whether uh, it was actually a proportionate uh, and uh, means to address the violation. If I say that correctly. Okay, great. So we have time for one or two more questions. So please uh, share your experience or comments or questions with us. But in the meantime, I want to ask you also about. Um, the very stigmatizing um, effects of such uh, risk profiling, um, because obviously it's about sensitive data and especially when the accumulation of data comes together. Did the, did the court help us um, say something more about how stigma, um, how, how these, these policies and laws create stigma and uh, through that, you know, enlarge um, the potential, uh, the, the ugly potential for discrimination. Is that something we can take from the Siri case 
to, let's say, racial profiling or religious profiling? Um, yes. So um, the, the court said that uh, the image of a neighborhood as a pro problematic neighborhood uh, contributes to the stereotyping and reinforces the neg negative image of the uh, people living there. Um, even if there have no risk reports been generated about them. So the actual uh, only um, selecting these neighborhoods already, uh, there was a risk of uh, stereotyping and stigmatization. Um, and because uh, of the um, uh, great impact on private life uh, and the fact um, that there was no transparency, Uh, the court judged that there was definitely a risk to discrimination uh, based on lower socioeconomic status or immigration background. Okay. I'm not sure how easy this can be used in other cases because it's always really, um, uh, and it really depends on the context and, and on the way the um, algorithm and risk reports are being created. That's true. So, Sorry, I was just, you know, I was try just trying to see, you know, what is it that we can take away from Syria as precedent for all these upcoming, um, uh, at least cases we know about, right, um, that are pending also before court. And and so um, we have another question from Gabriel that I think is hitting on something really important here, which is uh, the involvement of the private sector, right? I mean, uh, government, as much as its powers and uh, are expanding, Uh, can't do much of this work without private sectors, whether it's like private health insurance or it's private, um, you know, educational questions, you know, so to help us to help collect all that information. So what is the role of the private sector in terms of Siri? Is that, you know, are we are we missing something? Are we missing like an important pillar here uh, by us focusing on the state and not really um, seeing the role of the um, the, the private sector, especially in, in the way that they also help obscure transparency, um, especially because the private sector does not fall under the freedom of information law. I mean, that's definitely a, a big issue. And, and in the Siri case, uh, what was interesting, uh, th th so there was a private uh, uh, firm that actually developed the algorithm, but was also uh, Testing, so the the information was sent to this private firm, uh, who was like entering the information into the algorithm and then sending the risk reports back to the government, and then the government actually said that this was good for privacy because this meant that no single government institution had all the information, rather than it being horrible because uh, how can you hold this private firm accountable? Um, so, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with Gabriel. Um, that's, um, it's difficult to hold these companies to account. And, um, luckily for us in the Siri case, we didn't have to because there was enough to go with, um, against the government. Thank you. We have another question from Joseph, which is an interesting one. By ask, I mean, the thing is, if risk profiling is increasingly uh, considered to be important or even legitimate, even if not legal by some um, actors, uh, why is it that you think that the, the, the state secretary or the state did not appeal the decision? Um, it seems that there's like almost a contradiction here between, you know, wanting to use more risk profiling and announcing a super series. Um, at the same time, not appealing Siri. So it's kind of trying to think kind of strategically and, you know, what do you think is ahead of us? You know, um, what or what made that decision so unappealable? But why? what is it that we need to be aware of coming uh, in future uh, um, legislation? So I think it's a really good question. And I, we discussed it and I was actually not too sure why they chose this path, but I think it was a risk aversion uh, strategy by the state to just, because the, the media took such a strong stance, uh, the public debate against Siri, um, and they already had um, the Dutch climate case where they appealed and then went to the court of uh, su uh, the Supreme Court. And that takes so long. And um, I think if the, if the public thinks that Siri is wrong, then the state should also, uh, would be wise to listen to that and to not appeal. 
Um, and then on top of that, it was uh, because this journalist found out that no single case of fraud was detected. Um, it felt like there was not really a reason to appeal uh, to save Siri. So I think they took their losses. Uh, they lost this one uh, battle, but they want to win the war. Mm-hmm. Yes. So thanks so much for bringing up uh, something that relates to our last question, the kind of the time question, you know, like not only one is a good time to do strategic litigation, but obviously for the government, it's also a question of when not to appeal when the media has already, you know, has has firmly framed that that case as a winning case for um, uh, people on the digital rights front. So on the on the and the timeline, the last question is like, uh, uh, also addressed to you as someone who tried to coordinate the 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 the, the coalition. Um, this was, I guess, a race against time too, right? Because you had to coordinate so many stakeholders and so many moving parts, and you had to keep all the deadlines in mind. Is there some insights you could share with us as to how to manage cases with such large coalitions like this? Um, the timing yes. moment, and you know, is there something you could share with us uh, as? Um, uh, as those also facing those such challenges? Yes, I really like this question because it's really important um, and, and not something you maybe think about when starting uh, strategic litigation. Um, we had a lot of meetings. Uh, it was pre, pre-COVID, so we were <laughs> able to have them live. And it meant that we could really discuss all the nitty-gritty details, uh, the, the legal nitty-gritty, but at the same time could discuss public campaign, what to do. We always checked with each other when there was a a, a request by a journalist for an interview. uh, We um, considered, okay, they asked a trade union, but who should we also um, send along with them to to provide an extra perspective? Uh, so we were uh, always really um, collaborating and thinking about all these issues. Um, we, I mean, of course, we had the case lawyers and, and in the end, they decide uh, how to um, plead in, uh, b- before the court. But we, uh, all the civil society organizations were able to provide a lot of input um, and to really make sure that the, the campaign the the message also is heard in court and in the legal documents and not only the so that you do not only have the legal win in court but also the political win thank you i think this is a very important obviously message for everyone anyone interested in strategic litigation or doing strategic litigation that the law is only part of it and that the the political and the kind of the media message has to be sometimes even louder um, so that we can debate, initiate even more debate or uh, make sure that the debate continues rather than just ends with, with a particular case, right? So thanks so much, Mero. This was fantastic. And I'd like to uh, hand over to Judith to um, help us wrap up this this particular Thank uh, you, talk, Nat. but allow us uh, to engage even further in upcoming talks. Thank you very much, Nahid. That's great. Uh, thank you so much for moderating this event so efficiently. And thank you also, Meryl, for talking us through the detail of your practical experience with the case and with the case management as well. You're right. That is something that we don't always hear an awful lot about. Um, so thanks for that. And here is now uh, another reminder that this webinar has been recorded and that the recording will be made available on our website and our YouTube channel soon. And for the academics amongst you, please feel free to use this in your teaching and your research and to share it with anybody else you think might be interested. Um, This was supposed to be our final event in the series, but because we had to actually reschedule our event last week, it is not. um, But we are actually now in discussion with the speaker and the moderator from last week to reschedule. And this is just to say that it's now likely to take place the week after next, either the 23rd or the 24th of November. So if you are interested in talking about that, we are still hoping to welcome Carla Clark and Amos Cho to talk about miscalculating income, taking on digital, digitized universal credit in the UK. And there is still time to register for that event as well by following the links on our website. But for now, um, I would like to close this and thank everybody to for coming here and for 
uh, being so participatory and giving us all these wonderful questions. I hope that you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did. And um, I hope to see you again next week or the week after more like for our final event. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>